Hey folks, Killman here, Killman, at your service and taking a quick break from defending the nation and the realm. How are you all? Hope you're doing well. Just got thinking before about, you know, the good old days of renting videos out and taking them back home and copying them. <coughs> I, I heard tell that some people did that kind of thing. I mean, speaking to you now, as you know, a life obsessed, complete movie geek, nerd, obsessive, whatever you want to call me. That's what I grew up being. And that's what I've maintained my life totally endorsing. But back in those days, now in the 70s, I was going to flicks every single day, every single day um, after school. And I'd be there all night long. It was a second home for me. Um, I've discussed it before. And... But I knew then that I wanted those films. I didn't just, once the film finished, oh, I want to watch it again. I want to watch that bit again. I want to hear that bit. I love that bit of music there. Oh, so, but back in those days, you didn't have access to like getting the film yourself and being able to watch it and at your own leisure, play its music. Well, you could get the soundtracks and I did get a few of those, but it wasn't the way it is today. Um, but, I had one of those things at home, uh, a three-in-one unit, which was like a made by Binatone. It was a, t a little, a little four and a half inch black and white TV screen. It was a radio and a cassette recorder as well, a cassette player. That, by the way, is um, Danny Elfman's exquisite, unique avant-garde score for Clive Barker's unique, uh, absurd avant-garde Nightbreed. The score, I think, is better than the film. The score is wonderful. Um, I had one of these three-in-one things, so I used to record films off the TV, and it's one of them where the, the microphone didn't, it was an external mic, so you had to like, ever shh, be quiet, be quiet. I mean, Mrs. Kiltman will tell you about the days of taping music from uh, Top of the Pops, and again, you had to put the mic there and just get on the room to shut up and be quiet, you know, and that's what it was like, and it was, and then I'd play these recordings back, obviously, you know, like, you wouldn't get a full film on one one side. You'd have to have a little break in it in between, hoping for the film to be on like ITV, so you'd have an advert break to change the tape over. But listen to things like Halloween, so I could hear the dialogue and listen to the music, and I'd just sit there with my eyes closed, and I'd see the film unspooling before my mind's eye. And then, of course, you know, it got to my video recorders, 79, 80, certainly 81, uh, Pretty much, you know, that was the thing. You got a, a VCR, and uh, I remember because my mum knew, big kilt mama, knew that I was massively obsessed with movies, and it, it was just the thing that floated her son's boat. And um, she said to me, "What, you know, what list a load of films that you know that you like?" And I was thinking, "Oh, I wasn't stupid. I went, Christmas was coming up. You see, yeah, it was Christmas. I thought, hmm." Why are you asking me this, Mama? And uh, she said, no, just put down stuff. And I was getting, you know, um, Starburst magazine, Starlog. Uh, I was getting Video World and Video Today and Vid I don't know, all, whatever they were fucking called back in those days. Loads of magazines all. And some of you will remember that they were a glorified excuse to put lots of tits and bums in. Another major attraction to these magazines because a lot of the, the videotapes back in those days were softcore porn. So a lot of these things were advertised and you'd have like little centre folds as well. <laughs> you know, I, I just looked at the, the video reviews, obviously. And uh, so I knew films that were coming out. I knew of the likes of, I mean, I knew of Mad Max. I knew Friday the 13th. <coughs> I knew, you know, obviously all the horror films and Dawn of the Dead and that. And I'd seen a lot of them because I was able to get in the flicks to watch these things at a very tender, wee young age. Totally wrong, but hey, didn't do me any harm, did it? So, he says, looking around at a room full of axes, knives and toy chainsaws. <laughs> but, uh, so I knew these films and I'd seen a lot of them. And obviously things had been on TV and I'd recorded them and then I'd listen to them again and again and again. So I thought, she must, why, were you, why would you ask me this? So I wrote a list of about, you know, 
I'll be honest, about 75 movies, all of which I knew were available, you know, on video cassette. And um, Christmas morning turned up and I stumbled down the stairs at like, what, I don't know, half two in the morning, <laughs> whatever it was. And um, lo and behold, beneath the tree, there was a video shaped, you know, package and a couple of other packages which look like the big, you know, videotape boxes. Oh, fucking wow. Yeah, man. Ripped it open. Actually, I think I did the films first because what's coming next is more relevant the way it worked out. I opened what, what turned out to be two movies and I still have them. The first two movies I ever actually owned they were on my list. Scanners, look at that. Scanners in the big guild home video box. Look at that, isn't that amazing? Michael Ironside, oh, fucking awesome stuff. Scanners will blow your mind. 10 seconds, the pain begins. 15 seconds, you can't breathe. 20 seconds, you explode. <laughs> Absolutely fucking awesome. And that is from that must be night, Christmas 1981 that I got that. But not only that, and it's it's Peter Max. Not only that. Now look at this. This is Intervision. Remember Intervision? Used to do a lot of um, cardboard uh, covers and sleeves for their cassettes. The Exterminator. Peter! If you're lying, I'll be back. Now, however you say his name, Robert Ginty, Robert Ginty, who plays the Exterminator, Vietnam veteran, who's black friend, Played by the, the great, is it Steve Jones? Is it Steve Jones? It is, isn't it? He was the big muscle bound guy. He's in a lot of Chuck Norris movies as well. And um, fantastic. He gets attacked and killed after saving his life back in Vietnam and then back again on the mean streets of New York. Uh, you know, the gang then killed, well, beat up and literally crippled. And he's a vegetable, uh, his best friend. So he goes on a killing spree to take the gang back. And then he goes vigilante and starts taking out other people. That is not him, of course. That muscle-bound, motorcycle-wearing, you know, vigilante there is not Robert Ginty, Ginty. But uh, it's a great image. So that was on my list. Look at that as well on the back. That's not in the movie. <laughs> I know it's that. But I opened it and I was like, oh my God, because these were certificate X movies. Oh, Jesus, yeah. More, more thanks for kissing these boxes. Oh, wow, wow. This is the machine. <laughs> Ripped it open. I mean, what I obviously hadn't noticed was that word there. And there was a Sanyo VTC 5000 Betamax video recorder. It had picture search in black and white. It had freeze frame in black and white. It didn't have slow motion, although you could do frame by frame advance in black and white, and you got noise bars across it. That didn't matter. What did matter to my very tender, what would I be? I would be 1981 that Christmas. But I'll be 11 or 12 years old. 12 years old, I think. And um, what mattered to me was, and it was a top loader, oh, it's Betamax! Oh, fuck that. Fucking Betamax. They're shit. My mother had just spent, as well, I mean, as well as this stuff, she bought me loads of other things, T-shirts, Star Wars figures, and fucking all sorts of shit. Like, Because even though I was watching things like The Exorcist and The Hills of Eyes, I was still a kid at heart. I like my toys. Pretty much still do. <laughs> I was looking for action figures then. Of course, there's no stopping the action figure cavalcade. This one's been in the grow bag. But, um, so she spent an absolute fortune. That machine had cost about 250 quid, I think. These, and this is the, this is the, the real, you know, kick in the chunks really, is that back in those days, you didn't have sell through. Yeah, what they'd done, what she had done with my sister-in-law, my brother who lives in Vancouver, his wife, still his wife, uh, 
she and Lynn had gone uh, trolling all around Liverpool trying to find somewhere that would sell them movies out of my list. And in, in, in one place they did find someone who said, look, okay, I will sell you them, uh, but you're gonna, I'm going to have to charge you dealer price. Dealer, back in those days, one of these cost 70 quid back in those days. 70 quid. I mean, they obviously saw them coming and charge whatever he wants. I think that was a 70 pound one, and that was like 50 quid. I know because my sister-in-law did tell me after I was such an ungrateful twat. She took me to one side and she went, do you know how we spent ages trying to find places that would sell movies to us? And that's all we could get out of your list. And your mum spent an absolute fortune on you. And you just throw it back in her face. Humble pie. And of course, Beta Max. Beta was better than VHS. Yeah, we know VHS won out because JVC swamped the market. And poor Sony and Sanyo got fucking the noses pushed out. But Beta was technically superior. The cassettes were smaller. And they were infinitely just superior to VHS. And um, so I, I still have quite a collection of Beta Max uh, cassettes and VHS cassettes as well. And in fact, what I just noticed, because uh, obviously I haven't seen these for donkey's years, but it did set up in the conservatory. I set up a new little studio there. And just for a bit of fun, I put a load of old uh, you know, cassettes, VHS and Beta Max on the, on the window ledge. And these two were amongst them, but I hadn't really made the um, the connection that, oh my God, these are the first two films you ever actually owned. And if you look in here, there it is. Remember them? Look at that. Hey! Important. Please rewind tape, because if you don't, you're a twat. And you've really pissed off the people who run the, the video library, and also the people who then rent out that cassette after you, if no one else, else has remembered to rewind it. Because it was a pain in the arse, wasn't it? It was also a pain in the arse when your machine was a bit crap. It was running to the ground and you were using like an old it was an old copy and you wanted to watch the film again and you had to rewind it. was going... Like, oh, God almighty. And then it would just go... Uh, and stop. Do you remember that? You were like, shit, what's happened? And of course you couldn't get the cassette out. Oh, God, no. Then, you know... Whilst my mates were getting underneath the bonnets of cars and learning how engines were and stuff like that, and a couple of them learned how to fly fucking planes as well, I was disemboweling Beta Max and VHS video recorders and learning how to you know, get tapes out of mangled tapes and put them back in correctly and repair them, replace the drum heads and all that, like, and fine tinker little bits and the mechanisms, learning how to do all that. Aye. Also, I could watch films. Um, but what I've just noticed, and only now I remember how this came to be, when I opened this, and by the way, that's how we got it, we didn't get this, uh, the exterminator, in the, the proper cardboard seat, that's, as you see it there, that's how it, that's how my mum, my mum bought it, so they put the card inside the big video box, the rental box, but I've opened this, after many, many decades, and what have I found, it's not the original cassette, I've ditched the fucking cassette, haven't I? Because what's in there is the uncut copy <laughs> on VHS as well. So, you know, thereby making a complete mockery of my little trip down, you know, nostalgia lane. <laughs> the Exterminator, certificate X, in brackets, full uncut version. And that is the full uncut one, because as many of you may know, the Exterminator, as notorious as it was when it first came out in the UK, was trimmed. Yes, Jim Furman and the BBFC had took their little snippy scissors and removed the extended moments of the Vietnam flashback sequence, prologue sequence, where they're all captured by the Viet Cong, and uh, one poor guy, he gets a machete in his face, and, and they're, they're, they're tied between two stakes, there's three of them, and uh, including the guy that's going to become the exterminator, and he goes, when do you attack Lampa? And he goes, er... Uh, June 26th, he goes, that's what our spies said. And then he does one of the most bizarre yet horrific beheadings because he doesn't actually sever the head off. He goes, and you see it in a couple of flashbacks as well, and it's, it's at different speeds the way they do it. But in the full uncut version, he just slices through the neck like that. 
and the guy's head just goes, he goes, blood comes out, blood gushes from the, the wound, and his head then goes, uh, and then hangs on a, a thread of flesh, like that. And you're like, oh my God. But in the full and cut version, that goes on for even longer, and it's all, Jesus. And there's a couple of other moments later on in the film which have been slightly, ex well, they're just slightly longer than what the, the British viewing public were allowed to see back in those days. But uh, Scanners, of course, was always uncut. There's never like a, a change there. And of course, Scanners infamously had, kaboom, the head going up there, which was just one of the best. One of the best cinematic moments. And of course, that, that cassette there got fucking hammered with the, you know, the frame by frame advance and the freeze frame on that, uh, on that, that giblety, you know, eruption, that scarlet geyser of pure, you know, grew and head cheese. And then, of course, the end, you know, where Michael Ironside and Stephen Lack, is it, uh, have their scanner jewel at the end and all, like, prosthetics and veins are bursting and popping, eyes explode, and Stephen Lack, you know, cavern and veil, as he's called, uh, begins to rake open his own face. Oh, man. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Those days were awesome. So, folks, as you can tell, I was just sitting off from the endless tirade of real life. <laughs> and you all know I don't do that very well. So, I just thought, a little trip down memory lane there with the exterminator and those lovely guys, the scanners. So, folks, Comment below. Let me know what your first experiences are like. Well, a watching movies, cinema. I would, I would presume. Although a lot of you will have been born way later, and you'll have had access to home video right from the way go. But what were your first movies? What were your, what were your, what are the experiences that, that shaped your movie going? You know, adventures. Your outlook on this cinematic invention of pure imagination. Let me know. And uh, I'll get back to you all in a wee while. Let me just do a bit more of, uh, you know, this sort of national security bullshit. <laughs> and a bit more of this. This soundtrack is awesome, though. So, folks, in the meantime, and indeed the in-between time, you guys stay happy, stay healthy, keep it kilted, keep it Celtic. If you can, wear a kilt. If you can't, dream of wearing a kilt. Real men wear skirts. And I'm going to see you all <sighs> later. And please rewind your tape.